had some more complications with that young woman that was having the baby. So we're going to have prayer for her in just a moment. I want you to look with us here. Psalms 124. Begin reading in verse number 1. I found this the other day, though I've read through it several times, and God just spoke to me in a mighty way. And you be much in prayer this morning. I pray God will use it to bless you and strengthen you. Psalms 124, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1 this morning. Psalms 124, verse 1. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul, then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath given us, a, a, un, us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped and our help is in the name of the Lord who has made heaven and earth. Would you bow your heads with us? God, we thank you for the grace and mercy that you've extended to all of us. We thank you, God, for the ability, Lord, just to even stand in this sacred place today. Pray, God, that you would bless our church and that you would save lost souls. And God, that you just might minister through your precious word this morning. I pray that you'd give me an unction of power from the Holy Spirit. And God, we certainly pray for that young woman who's at the hospital today struggling. God, I pray that you'd put your hand upon her right now. And God, that you would just heal her from what's going on. We know that you're more than able today. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. And amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing to honor the Lord this morning. I want to preach here out of these first few verses. I'll cover most of this chapter, all of this chapter. Um, but I had this thought as I began to read. He says in verse number one, and then again he says it in verse number two. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say. If you don't know uh, the book of Psalms here, these songs that would have been sung, but there's differences in these as they're written. They were di written by, they were wrote by different people. And I don't really know where to begin in this message, but I guess it's only right to start with the life of David and what I'm going to do this morning. And David is the one who had penned this or have it penned. And he says, if it had not been the Lord, and we can just pause there for a long time and shout the rest of our life and think of if it had not been for God, where would we be today? If it had not been the Lord, what would we have faced alone? If it had not been been the Lord. But these Psalms starting in chapter 120 and going for the next 15 Psalms are all Psalms that are a degrees of ascent, meaning that that time that they were probably used if whether it was by the Hebrews or Israel there um, at some portion. Now David is only credited for four of these Psalms and Solomon one and the other 10 I'm unsure of, but um, it's not just not disclosed unto you and I. But as they would begin to to do as they were on their way to Jerusalem or possibly ascending to the Mount Zion or even up the steps of the temple, they would begin to rehearse these psalms. These are specific psalms that they would begin to rehearse as they made their way to the house of God or made their way up the, the steps or up the mountainside when they were going to worship the Lord. These are the psalms that they would rehearse and begin to sing to themselves and to sing as the congregation. No wonder by David says here, he says, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, now Israel may say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, and I want you to understand today, there's something vital about what we say and what we sing and what we speak to ourselves. I thought this morning as I was praying back there, there's many of you who much like me when I was a young person or even as a young Christian, I just entertained anything in my ears. I listened to any type of music, any type of, I mean, 
I'd be on my way to church as a lost person and I'd listen to Tupac or uh, Metallica or some other genre of music, some rock group or some rap group or maybe even an old Hank Williams song, right? Don't get too spiritual on me. Then I'd walk through the chores and wonder why I couldn't shout for the glory of God. Amen. I knew it'd get good in the beginning. Um, but you know what happens here? David is telling him, man, I was on my way to the house of the Lord and I begin to rehearse to myself. You want to know how to have a, a, an amazing service before you ever get to these doors, before you ever make it here, you rehearse a few things to yourself. I think first of all, we can begin and start by saying, if it had not been for the Lord, I think David is implying unto them very specifically, there's a sole responsibility here that David is taking no credit and he wants to give all the credit to God and to God alone. It's amazing to know if it had not been for the Lord, where we would be today. I mean to tell you, there's no stopping where our mind might begin to run. I mean, some might say, well, I wouldn't even be alive today or I'd be in jail or I don't know where you're at today. But no matter, at some point, you've got to realize that the Christian today, that God has ordained your life. There's the perfect will of God that God has placed in front of you. And, and to lost friend today, I don't believe in chance and I don't believe in circumstance. I don't think that you, you, you might have thought that you finally drug yourself up out of church, but I believe God has ordained this service to be that when you come here that God would have the exact songs, the exact messages, how fitting and how wonderful the songs were this morning and how God would ordain things that you have to understand. There is God's plan that we all need to humble ourselves to and disobedience can hinder, disappointment can hinder, distractions can hinder what God is doing in our life. But dear friend, as we become dependent upon God, it is God and God alone that we can use even in a point of brokenness inside of us, even when things are not going right. Because dear friend, if it had not been for the Lord, now here's a person as he begins to look, I think of all the things that he started from, what God brought him from, what God took him through. And as I first began to pray about this, I thought, man, you know what I'm going to preach about? I'm going to preach about Jonah. Jonah was down inside the whale's belly. If it had not been for the Lord, he'd have died in that whale or fish's mouth. He'd have died down inside a dark cave. And then I thought, some more. I thought, well, you know what else? If it had not been for the Lord, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego would have got burned in the fiery furnace. Daniel would have got consumed by the line. If it had not been for the Lord, amen. It's getting better and better as I stand up here tonight. But you better understand this tonight. If it had not been for the Lord, there's something specific and moving about the one who's penning this and writing this. So of all the people in the Bible, I want to focus on one individual today. I want to look look at David's life. If it had not been for the Lord, you know, the Bible says in Romans three and 20, he says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in his sight. He says, for by the law is the acknowledging of sin. You've got to understand today that if you've been born again, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is sole responsibility was God who looked down from heaven and said, they need to be saved. And I'm willing. And I I love him so much, I'm going to send my son to die on the cross of Calvary. Preacher, how are you getting that out of that? Because David, the Bible says, was a little shepherd boy out inside of a flock. And David never grew up and said, you know what I'm going to be when I grow up? I'm going to be a king. When I grow up, I'm going to be a king and I'm going to, re I'm going to lead this world and I'm going to run things and I'm going to do things my way. Can I tell you something? The sole responsibility fell upon God. When God looked down and said, I want you to find somebody who's the apple of my eye, a boy, a man who's after my own heart. And then saw a Samuel standing there and he says, Samuel, you go down to the household of Jesse and you find one there. And so here comes the prophet and the prophet comes and he lines all these people up and he lines them up. And as he's standing there, he looks at one who's heightened stature's great, who's strong, who's mighty and who's able. And God says, no. And he goes down through the household of Jesse, goes through seven men seven boys and finally he looks at Jesse and says is there not any left and Jesse says oh you know what I forgot about that youngest one no one cares about the youngest one <laughs> hey man you youngest child that's when you're supposed to shout okay hey man listen and so it goes on to time and time he says yep yeah, there's one out there his his name is David he's out there the she he's just a rudy little thing he's just a scrawny little boy he's kind of slender got no meat on his bones he's tall but that's all he's got going for him he says bring him here and the Bible says they bring David and they set him down before Samuel 
and God speaks to Samuel and says, Samuel, that's the one I want you to anoint king over Israel. Now, Samuel's already afraid. Samuel said, if Saul finds out I'm here, he'll kill me. And God says, take a heifer with you and offer there. Can I tell you today, God's the one who will give the sacrifice and God's the one who will do the anointing in your life that will make all the difference. It was him solely responsible. None of us were saying, God, we are good enough to offer a sacrifice. God, none of us are where we need to be so you can come and redeem us. None of us were righteous. You've got to understand the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 22, he says, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And he says, and by all things almost are purged by the shedding of blood. You better understand this. It was not just the blood of somebody, but it was sole responsibility for God and his son Jesus Christ to die for you and I. Because there's good men and women who have given their lives to make this country what it is. There's good men and women who have died to protect their family. But it was not enough for the men and women of our entire earth, our entire nation, our entire state, and for the generations to come. But his blood, being pure, being undefiled, was enough. If it had not been for the Lord, you and I would have died lost and died without pardon and without the remission of sin. Him solely as God would stand there. David can't say it. I think as David is pinning this, David can't say, you know what happened in my life? I had good parents and they groomed me to be a king. David can't say that. David can't say, well, you know, my dad was a king, so I grew up and I became a king. He can't say that. David can't say, I've been trained in the art of war. He can't say that he was educated in the finest schools. He can't say that he was prepped for the pressure of leadership that would fall upon him. And David must solely stand here and pin this as he's on his way to the house of God and said, man, surely and solely the only one responsible who is moved is God and God alone. And David knows if it had not been for the Lord, none of us would be able to be here today. Aren't you glad that the Lord came looking for you? I'm glad he left the 90 and 9 and found this one. And I'm glad every time that God saves an individual and changes them and makes them a new creature. Thank God. <laughs> we ought to stop and pause for just a minute and shout for the glory of God that we've been born again because a God alone devised a plan to send his son and he would come born of a virgin to die for you and I. He is the one that is solely responsible for redeeming man's souls from the world that we see today. I think he's telling him if it had not been for the Lord, sole responsibility, sole credit, so honor, so praise belongs unto God. And not only that, the Bible would continue on. He says, then he says, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quickly. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. You know what else he's telling him? Not only is God solely responsible, but dear friend, he was a sure, he was a sure resources they begin to walk for him. David said I never asked for the anointing. I never asked to be king but when God put me in that position when God anointed me then God would go about as a sure resource in my life everywhere I went. You better hear me tonight. You need to quit trying to live a Christian life without the resources God has provided for you and I. You were never meant to walk in this world without the Holy Spirit. You were never lived, made to walk without the word of God if he wanted us to live Without the word of God, he would have never printed it and planted it and given it in one book after three languages and, and 40 some writers and thousand years put it in an English speaking Bible that we could hear. If God wanted you to live without the word of God, dear friend, he would have just said, just keep listening for my voice. I'll speak on the inside and thank God that he can still speak to us, but he's given us the word of God as a sure resource in our life. Amen. Trusting God at times is easy. Some days trusting God is the easiest thing we'll have to do. But I'm going to tell you tonight, some days trusting God is the hardest thing you'll have to do. Amen. Now we're getting somewhere today. You hang on. The greatest toll on our faith and the simplest words I can say is to trust God in spite. Now that, that is exactly what faith is. Faith is saying I'm trusting God at his word. I'm trusting God at what he's done and what he's going to do. 
In spite of the situation, in spite of the circumstance, I believe that God is who he says he is, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. I'm going to have faith in God that he is going to be what we need him to be. You know when David pins the words in Psalm 37, I once was young, but now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging after bread. The Bible would go also, he would stay on and go on. But right before that, he says, man, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord and he delighteth in his way. And he says, though he fall, he not, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholding him with his hand. And then he says, he says, for I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging after bread. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, listen to me, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. He is telling him, he is a sure resource in your life, Christian. Oh, if it had not been for the Lord, I would have fallen a long time ago. And I have failed God before, but I would have stayed down if it had not been for the Lord. When my heart broke, I would have stayed in a heartbroken situation. When my mind gave up on me, I would have stayed in a broken situation. When I didn't see any hope, but David says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He's saying, when my heart is overwhelmed, he's trying to tell him there's a sure resource for our life. I'm, I've got to tell you today, I've got to tell you, before I come to pastor you here, I prayed and I fasted and I thought, you know what? This this is what God wants to do in my life. This is what God wants me to do. And so, you know, after I, I mean, it took some faith to really pray about it and fast about it. And it took some faith to approach my wife and say, I got a good job, honey. I'm, I'm a third of the way retired. I'll be retired by I'm 51. We'll have a good life and say, I think I'm going to quit my job. That takes some faith, my dear friends. I'm telling you, that takes some faith. I, I know you love your mom and dad. And, and, I, and I know we got a good home and we got a, a, a good little community here, but um, we're going to go to West Virginia. You live. It takes faith to tell your spouse that. <laughs> then I wrote up an intent, letter of intent, who I was, what I felt God was telling me to do, and I mailed it to this church. It didn't take much faith to mail it. It didn't take much faith to wait around. Oh, it's going to get good. The soul responsibilities to the Lord but the resource the sure resource is for you and so as I began to sit there I told my wife I said those people they don't like me or they don't they got a pastor months have gone by <laughs> they kept passing over me they didn't like me I guess on paper but <laughs> God kept bringing me back God wouldn't let me go aside I'm sure thankful Someone decided to call me because I really enjoy this life. <laughs> Listen to me for just a second. It wasn't hard to have faith to send it off. It wasn't hard to have faith when they said, we'd like you to come preach for us and come meet our, our, uh, our council or our group pulpit committee and all that stuff. Sure, that's fine. That sounds great. That wasn't hard. I'll never forget walking out of a little Sunday school room there. Brother Davey walked me to the door out there and he says, we really like you. And then I thought, oh God. God, I've had faith this far. I need you, Lord. I'll never forget driving home. I said, Jess, I'm pretty sure this is what the Lord wants. And honey, I'm pretty sure we're moving to West Virginia. And she says, well, I I'll never forget this. You know, you, you, my wife's not here, so I'm going to brag on her. She's a better pastor's wife than what you know. After I tell her, I'm going to quit my job, we're going to have faith, and we're going to work for the Lord, she says, honey, are you sure? And I said, I'm absolutely positive. She says, well, if you don't go, God will take everything we've got. The sure resource we have in the Lord. I think it is Isaiah that said that his hand is not short, nor is it slack. My friends today... We're not asking God to do enough. We have the resources at our fingertips and we're not utilizing the power of God the way the church was designed to impact their communities and their nations. We're not doing what God has commanded the church to do. 
I want you to understand this as we begin to go on. I, I, I love a cake as much as anybody, but faith is not cake and you can't serve it the same way. You know, you have cake, you have cake at special occasions. You got cake at birthday parties. You have cake at, uh, you know, certain events or gra- graduation parties or, or um, anniversary parties or maybe a wedding or something like that, some special occasion. Faith is not that way. Faith is a vitamin that you need daily in your life that you should be consuming. It is something not just for special occasions, but a resource you have every single day. It is something that you long for. When you trust God long enough, dear friend, you've got to get to a place where you understand that God is in control of this thing and without Him nothing shall be. And we need to continue to do what it is He said to do. He has given us the sure resource to do what God wants us to do. I thought people told me this all the time. I can't believe half the stories you tell. That's all right. You don't need to. Now I'm going to tell you this. Young people, you need to start building some stories yourself. You need to have some experiences where you stood on the battlefield and said, I'm standing before a giant. God, I'm ready for you to do something. God, I'm standing at the river banks of the Jordan and I'm ready for the waters to part either way in my life. And if nobody else knows about it, God, I want to see your sure resource in my life. You don't have to be 30 and 40 years old for God to help you and God to strengthen you. Matter of fact, the Bible said in 1 Samuel, he says there comes a time that he comes um, to the uh, um, to, to the valley there and, the, and Israel's fight against the Philistines and the Bible says that this giant comes out and he tells them if anybody is able to fight with me and kill me then we'll be your servants but if we prevail against him and kill him then shall you be our servants and serve us and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself for 40 days for 40 days this giant goes to the mouth of the valley in front of all the armies and he says is there any takers today who's willing to fight me? Because if you beat me, we're just going to surrender and we'll be your servants. But if I beat your champion, we're going to go ahead and take over. And you know this goes on for, think about it, for 40 days the sure resources at their fingertips and nobody is willing to stand up and fight. And here comes David. He's got his parchments. He's got some bread. He's got some corn. He's up there. He's just the youngest of all his brothers and he comes to the battlefield and it just happened to been maybe day 40. Oh Lord. And when he gets there, he says, where's my brother's at? I need to give dad some news. He wants to make sure everybody's doing okay. And about that time, he hears an echo in the background. Is there any takers who wants to fight today? Is there anybody? Because I'm defying your God. I'm defying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And David says, who is that ugly voice in the background? And about that time, someone says, man, you know what? If someone slays that giant, he's going to have the king daughter. He's going to be second. and He's going to be something great. David says, I'll take him on. Hey man, I won't take him on for the prize. I'll take him on for the purpose because he's saying, I'm willing to stand for the Lord. You better not be in this for the fishes and the loaves, honey. You better be in this because God is saving souls and redeeming us. There's a sure a resource for you and I. And the Bible says, you know the story. He goes out there and he kills the giant. It's an amazing story. It's a beautiful story. I mean, when David stands there as this young boy. First of all, the Bible says he looks at him and says, I'm going to cut your head off today. David doesn't even have a sword. And he's telling the giant, that's what you need to tell your giant. I'm going to cut your head off today. You say, what What sword do we have? We have the word of God. Amen. Then he goes on to say, he tells them as the sure resource, he's standing there. And then he tells him as he says, man, he says, you can fight all you want. You can, you can go on all you want. He says, but we are going to do this in the name of the Lord. And that, you know that story. But listen, when he comes there and you think, man, David had a good one. He had a sure resource that he used in his life. He beat the bad guy. Can I share you something? He did not beat the bad guy. He beat a bad guy. Now you hang on for a second. This resource that you've got is not limited to one battle. We think that when we overcome something in life, we're never going to have to face another thing. I don't know about these preachers who stand up and tell you, if you just get saved, everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be a bed of roses. You're going to have health, wealth, and prosperity. You'll drive a Mercedes Benz and live in a mansion. Boys, my mansion's in the next life. It ain't in this one. Amen. We're going to have some battles in this life. We're going to have some trouble. You know what? After, after that, the Bible says uh, in chapter uh, chapter number 19, or excuse me, in 18, he takes this woman to be his wife. Then about that time, the king, you know, he's not really kind of trusting him. And King Saul says, you know what? If you're really for me, he said, I'm going to go ahead and give you my daughter. He said, you go out and slay these Philistines. And the Bible says, David, he presents 
presented himself good and he starts slaying. I mean, he becomes a warrior for the king. And here he comes back. He comes back um, with the foreskin of these men that he's killing. He comes back with heads and throws them at the king's feet and says, he says, king, I'm doing it for you. And all of a sudden, the king sees an anointing on David's life that he used to have in his own life. And the Bible says he becomes afraid of the spirit that David has. And then he becomes jealous because they're like, man, Saul's killed thousands, but this man, he's killed tens of thousands. So jealousy and fear take a hold of the king. And the next thing you know, the person, his father-in-law is trying to kill him. You thought your family was messed up. Amen. Listen, he's literally trying to kill him. And David keeps going back to the same resource. It's kind of like that bill, that barrel meal. It just ain't running out. David just keeps running out. David's running for his life, but God's still supplying his need. David's hiding in a cave, but God is still supplying his need. David is saying, God, I need you. And he says, I'll never leave you, nor yet forsake you. He's still there with them. He's a sure resource. He was a sure resource when he went on to become the king. Matter of fact, I think that's why David excelled so much. Because David says, man, I know what it's like to come out of a pasture field. I know what it's out just to hang out with the sheep. Now I'm the king. He can appreciate everything. He's been through so much. He's done so much. And the thing that got him to the top, he's holding on to. What is it? It's the Lord. It's his sure resource. Matter of fact, I think being sure of something. You ever been sure of something? Kids, you ever build a tree house when your parents weren't looking? <laughs> When I was a kid, right, two years ago, <laughs> we'd build tree houses. We'd have rope, sometimes we'd have nails, and sometimes we didn't. Sometimes, you know, you just kind of put the boards up there, and that was your tree house. You'd get up there, and every once in a while, someone said, you sure it's okay? <laughs> and you'd say, yeah, come on up. It's going to be just fine. About that time they get halfway up, things start cracking and popping. He's like, all right, all right, let's get down. We we're not sure about that. David's saying, if it had not been for the Lord, a long time ago, I'd have died by the mouth of a bear. I'd have died by the mouth of a lion. I'd have died by the hand of that giant. If it had not been for the Lord, I'd have lost my mind when I was running in the wilderness. I'd have died by the hand of Saul. I'd have given up inside the cave of Adol. If it had not been for God, he says, but boys, it was the hand of God. He was my sure resource that got me all the way here. Don't you think that God's going to give you any less or any more? It was David that would cry and say, man, he's my shield. He's my buckler. He's my high tower to ensure that we can gain the victory in this life. He is our sure resource in a time of trouble, in a time of doubt. Matter of fact, Hebrews, he says, let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace in our time of need, our time of trouble, that he may give us mercy and help in those times. He today, Jesus Christ, dear friend, is, he is our Lord. And if it had not been for the resource he gave us, but Derek said it so wonderfully just a little bit ago. Some of you have testified about it. When I don't know how people make it without the Lord. If it had not been for the Lord, what would happen? Now, I've preached you happy, maybe. <laughs> but this last point is going to get serious. The Bible says here, he said, blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers and the snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who has made heaven and earth. Dear friend, we've got to understand this. If it had not been for the Lord, our soul, our soul responsible person who oversees us, who strengthens us, who he alone gives us salvation. If it not been for the sure resources, we would have been consumed years ago 
And if it had not been for the strongest restore ever been known to man, dear friend, we would have been lost by the wayside. I want you to notice something, and I didn't see it at first, and I didn't see it for a long time. The Bible says here, blessed be the name of the Lord who hath given us as prey to their teeth. He says there's a time, there's a time, and we see it over and over in the hand of God, where God will allow difficult situations to come in our life for us to grow up or turn loose of some things or go in a certain direction or change course or learn a lesson. He says our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers and the snare is broken and we are escaped. It does not say that they weren't captured. It says that we were, we were, verse number seven, as a bird that escaped out of the snare of the fowlers and the snare is broken. The reason the snare was broken is because the bird was caught. You've got to understand something. Even David is king. Now you look back over David's life. We find that he is so, he's giving so responsibility unto the Lord. He's a sure resource for him, but he's the strong restorer. Why would David need restored? The Bible says this. I mean, I mean to tell you, we all need forgiven today. The Bible says, for we have all come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. David has many triumphs serving God. And I'm telling you, David is one of my favorite Old Testament people. Many times we stand back and look at a man who's accomplished so much and place them on pedestals. I know I do. I try not to, but sometimes I do. Certain preachers, certain singers, just um, they just they speak to me in certain ways. And for some reason, I oftentimes put them on pedestals. I young, learned at a young age, no one needs to be on a pedestal. We are all here. Now you should honor your pastors. You should give them double honor as the Bible commands. You should honor esteem those who are labors amongst you. The Bible says in Romans, I think it is, that we should honor those who have rule over top of us. That, that, that meant for everybody, even children. Amen. You need to listen to your father and mother that it may be long with you. But with all that being said, David being one of my greatest heroes, I see all of these um, triumphs that David had. I mean, victory over victory. But you hardly hear about the tragedies that David had faced in life. Now, I'm going to pause for just a second. And I'm going to tell you just a couple. And I want you to understand today that you've not gone too far, that you've not done too much, that God cannot save, cannot strengthen, cannot restore, cannot repair, cannot replace what the devil has taken from us. Amen. Because there's plenty of people who can talk about, um, listen, all of their triumphs, but our tragedies, listen, they bring about pains, they bring about weights, they bring about difficult situations. I'm tired of people stare, sharing with me all the stars they have a process in their life. Share with me some scars where God has showed up and removed some things out of your life to make you who you say you are when the door's closed, to make you who you say you are when you're not in the house of God. And dear friend, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 12, the Bible says this, or 11, that David commits adultery against his uh, uh, against the leader in his army. Not only does he do that, he tries to cover it up. And when that fails, the Bible says he commits a pre meditated murder. He has this guy killed. This is the apple of God's eye. A man after God's own heart. Now you tell me today that the church doesn't need a restoration and you begin to listen to me closely. The Bible says Nathan the prophet comes at the time and finally Nathan taps him on the shoulder and says, buddy, you've done something wrong and he begins to explain to him. He says you're doing things the wrong way and if you would, and he gives him an illustration about a man who would have everything and take from a guy who had one and David says, oh you let me at him. I'll kill him and he says that Thou art the man, David. And then you read on a little bit further and the Bible says, and David fell upon his faith. Second Samuel chapter 12. And he began to cry out and he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shall not die. I'm telling you, God was going to strike him dead for what he done. You can pause right there and flip over to Psalms 51 and he will explain to him. He said, I cried unto the Lord. He said, Lord, I want you to restore or the joy of thy salvation. God, I want you to take and put a right spirit in me. God, I want you to wash me thoroughly as David would say unto him. But after that goes on, times change. You talk about having a restore in your life, in your family's life. The Bible goes on to say in 2 Samuel chapter 13 that of course David had multiple wives. Nine at the time I believe if I counted right. And at the time um, he had a son, his oldest son Amnon. At the time he comes and he he abuses and rapes his sister. Now, after that being said, listen, David scorns him and rebukes him and says, man, if you'd have just asked, we'd 
let you guys get married. You didn't have to do something. You talk about pain and suffering. Listen, when God says he can restore things, he's not talking about giving you new tires on your car. He's talking about mending the brokenness of the soul, of the mind, and of the heart. Amen. And the Bible says that Absalom stands by the wayside. And about that time, Absalom, the Bible says, is furious with his father because he didn't think he was harsh enough. He's furious with his stepbrother. And then two years passes and he says, David, Dad, I'm going to have a party just for us kids, you know. And uh, we're going to go down by the wayside by whether you shear the sheep. And no worry, we'll be all right. Just all of us men are going to go out there and have a party. And David says, well, you know, I'll stay here. Y'all can go be kids and play outside. They go out there and two years later, Absalom kills that man for what he did to his sister. And then Absalom turns aside and he begins to attack his father and to steal the kingdom away from David. I'm telling you tonight, you talk about a restoration that needs to take place in our nation. We have grandchildren who are stealing from their grandparents. We have children who are murdering their parents. We are living in a day where we need a restoration in our country like we have never seen. We need a strong restore that will show up and put things back in order. And about all these times, because we want to talk about David's pleasantries and David's good times. And we don't want to talk about the sorrow and the destruction and the pain that he went through. The Bible says about that time, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16, that David said unto Abashai, he said unto his servants, behold, he says he's come forth from my bowels. He said he seeks my life. How much more shall this Benjamite do? Let him alone and let him curse for the Lord hath bidden him. He says that the Lord may look upon my affliction. You know what he's saying? David is walking around and David is walking by the wayside and here comes this man. This man comes out of the house of Saul and he literally starts picking up rocks and throwing them at David and throwing dust in the air and screaming saying, you've got the blood upon your hands and you're guilty of this. And you know what David says? Just about that time, Bashai pulls out his knife. He says, I'm going to take this boy's head off. He, he ain't going to talk to my king that way. He ain't going to talk to my dad. I mean, I'm not letting him do that. And then the Bible says, David steals him and says, just let him be. Let him talk. He says, because that man reproving me right now, though he's not the prophet, he said, God sent him to do that because I'm not where I need to be. And the Bible says, as he continues on, he says, it may be that the Lord will look upon my affliction, that the Lord will requite me good for this cursing this day. Requite me literally means to turn back or to roll back to a beautiful place. David is saying, man, I'll take whatever you want, God, if you would just restore me back to a beautiful place. God, if you would just move on the scene that I can enjoy you. Christian friend today, you might have failed God, but that doesn't mean God doesn't love you and God doesn't want you and God doesn't want you back in the house of God doing what he designed you to do. They have a sure restore today. I believe God will restore us. I believe God wants to restore us. I think, matter of fact, if you begin to look closely in 2 Samuel, the Bible tells them in chapter 22 there, as he begins to cry out to him, he tells him there right before the last words that he's, he's going to die. The Bible says, And David spake unto the Lord the words of his song in a day, and the Lord delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior, the, uh, the saver. He says, Thou savest me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death come past me and the floods of ungodly men have made me afraid, the sorrows of hell have come past about, the snares of death prevented me. He says in verse 7, in my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God and he heard my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears. He says, then did the earth shake and tremble. He is telling a man, when I finally got humble and cried out to God, he moved back on the scene, dear friend. He is a sure, he is a strong restore because some of us need more restoration than the rest, but it's not too much for the Lord. You want to talk about a strong restore. We look at a nation today that is broken from the inside out. We look at a nation who is struggling on every front and we have so much humanism even within the church. We think that we're in control of things. And we've quit allowing the Holy Spirit move. We've quit allowing Him to guide us. We've quit allowing Him to direct us. And we've actually limited the Holy Spirit's workings because we think that person sinned too much. That person's too dirty. 
He's too much of a druggie. He's too much of a drunk. Well, it just pause for just a second. They've gone too far. They've, they've had too many divorces. They've had too many of this. They've had too many of that. My dear friend, you better understand something about your heroes in the faith. There's not a one of them, save for Jesus Christ in this book that I hold, who was perfect. There's not a one of them, even the elders of old, when they drug out the woman caught in the act of adultery, which is one of the most insane stories, I think, in the Bible. They caught this woman in the act of adultery, drag her out before Christ, before a crowd of people. Where's the man in the story? Someone shouted. Amen. Then the Bible said he reaches down and begins to write on the ground and they're talking and he says, you, he said, whoever's without sin, you'll go ahead and cast the first stone. He goes back to write and that's all. Can I tell you, when God moves, it's enough. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, if God will move on your life and you allow him to, it will be enough to save you, to strengthen you and the strong restore will take place in your life and heal what is broken in your life. God can restore the brokenness in our person inside of us. He can heal the brokenness inside of a marriage, inside of a family, inside of a friendship. God alone can heal our nation and this generation from destroying and breaking. God alone can restore the assurance that we have, the peace and the joy that he gives us in so much. I found this in my Bible and I, I went ahead and underlined it. First Chronicles 29 and 28. The Bible says that when he, talking about David, died in a good old age, full of days, riches and honor, and Solomon reigned in his stead. When David died, he died full of age. He lived all of his life. He died with his wealth. It was still there. He didn't lose everything. And he died with honor. You know what he's saying? In spite of his failures, in spite of the brokenness that happened, in spite of the shortcomings, because he humbled himself and said, God, I, I want you to move. God, I want you to forgive me. That's all he asked. The Bible says he died with honor. Why? Because he repented and he came in the hands of a strong restore. I never want to give up on anything. Never. Probably the biggest problem I've got in life. I borderline on the edge of hoarder. Because <laughs> I don't even want to give up on my trash. <laughs> I'm trying to get better. I'm going to tell this and I'm going to quit. About not eating leftovers that are so old. I can't tell you I don't eat leftovers because I live off of them. But I've learned a hard lesson about eating it when it's too old. Amen. When I say hard lesson, I tell you it's a hard lesson. All of a sudden, instead of things being, you know, that, that's only a couple days old, I, I want to know. I don't stretch the days out for myself. Why? Because I don't have the ability to control what's going on in that. You and I think that we're in charge. We think that we're in control. We think that we have ordained our steps and we are, we are doing something in this world. Dear friend, you listen to me. The only thing that will matter in this life is whether or not you've accepted Christ as your Savior. You say, preacher, I've gone through all this heartache. I've gone through all this pain. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and 10, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, will make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, settle you. Can I ask you to this? Maybe you stand in a position of no hope today. I want to encourage you. Whether you're, if you're lost today, you ought to run to an altar of prayer and say, God, I want to be saved. I want to be saved so I know that you're solely responsible for my soul. I want to be saved so I know that you alone are my sure resource that I could run to. And if I fail, God, he says that we have an advocate with the Father. He alone is the strong restorer in our life. If it had not been for the Lord, while the singers are coming, while we stand across the building, where would you be today? Maybe some of you Christians need to come pray. Just thank God for what he's done for you. If it had not been for the Lord, let me ask you this. I said this a minute ago as I was getting sidetracked there. Jonah would have died in the uh, whale's belly. Israel would have been wiped off the map. map. There would have been a man to which I don't know his name who hung to the side of Christ with his.